Hey, everybody. Um, it's a classic YouTube presentation, so a bunch of videos. In advance, thank the AV team, because I already created a shitload of problems, so thank you a lot. Let me start off with a little bit of fun. All right, the first thing I'd like to say to everyone is, let me go back, cool, is one thing as a product manager, building a company, building an organization, no matter what you do, every day has bad moments. And sometimes it's weeks and sometimes it's years of uphill struggles. So one of the things I believe is critical is finding the joy in the smallest things in your user base, in your product, in your Easter eggs. This is essential. Um, one of those we found just yesterday is, is quite marvelous, actually. Can you just switch over to the first uh, video, please? They need I to... have no strong feelings one way or the other. All right. So at first, can you, sorry, can you go back to the video, please? There's one thing that's really amazing about this. You see the likes and the dislikes, it's a little hard to see. It's 3,733 likes, 3,733 dislikes, okay? Now, we didn't do this. We had nothing to do with this. We didn't orchestrate it. This is just happening. Can you go to the search results page, please? Every single one of these results has the same. So there's a group of people out there it turns out a lot of them are in Spain and don't even speak the language of these videos, are sitting here for all the queries for Futurama neutral, neutral response, a few other ones, and making sure for every single one of these videos, the number of likes and the number of dislikes are the same. Okay? Now this, for me, made my fucking week, all right? <laughs> so I just got to say, you got to find these things and you have to cultivate them. Everyone's got different cultures, but this is critical. Number two, um, breaking things is hard, you know? Uh, you're taught at a very young age to not break stuff. And when you become a product manager, it's very important to think the opposite because great things are usually done by trying to break things. And why I say that particularly is that, look, I think a few of you are probably out there saving lives. Um, sometimes we all get that opportunity magically to change someone's life, and that's another theme. But... Just step back for a second and remember we're in software and if it breaks now and then, usually it doesn't matter. So just go out there and do some crazy shit. All right. So does everyone remember this? Just, just for those who didn't, this was one of our first big live streams. All right, now, the whole world is working now. I'm going home now. Yeah. 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 Showing Felix in a stable descent. And Felix is back to her safely, the new world record holder. All right, pretty amazing. Let me show you what we were observing during this. So the number of streams is at the top, and this is the point where he was in the sky jump. So as we get over here, 2 million streams at 25K feet. Keep going up, 5 million streams. And this was an odd hour, if anyone remembers. Like in the US, it was really off hours. You had to be up at 3 AM. But in different countries, people just kept coming on. And it was spreading like fire on Twitter. And more and more people were jumping into this. So we were freaking out when we were looking at the volume. And then at 128K, K, K feet, we had 8 million concurrent streams. So just to put that, you know, and then things start to die down and everything's cool. That was 8% of internet traffic on that day, okay? And so we were freaking out because as you know, you know, ISPs are ISPs. They do wonderful things, but they're not used to going this crazy over the top. So we're pushing in HD basically a huge percentage of volume on the internet. And we we're pretty sure we would have broken it and... A lot of people had trouble getting into whatever social app they wanted to use that day. But generally, this is the kind of thing you need to think about when you're thinking about product. OK. 
Okay, the next one. I think when I first started working in product management, the truth is, is that I was very US-centric. I actually grew up in Texas, so I was very Texas-centric, to be honest. Like my first startup, we didn't bother localizing anything. In fact, I don't think it was, I think it just, the 404 when we had it outside of anyone hitting it from an outside IP, we didn't even care. And so one of the things I've found over time is that most of your delight and inspiration will not come from your home country, it'll come from elsewhere. I think the best example of this is we started looking at queries on YouTube. And we started visualizing them and seeing what's interesting. And so basically, each one of these bubbles is a distinct set of queries around a topic. And the bigger the bubble, the more the queries are. So um, I think it's playing. Yep. We'll go through. And so you see these little spikes of different queries go up. Uh, Katy Perry, this is back in 2012. Michael Jackson, um, when he passed away. We had different things going on. And Jenna Marbles, a bunch of YouTube stars always pop up. You'll see in a second. I need to trim this slide down a little bit. But generally, in a second, in the Olympics. Yeah. And then that little guy pops up there, Gangnam Style. Okay. And so we didn't know what this was. And you know, you're looking at this thing and playing around with it. But it just kept getting bigger, right? <laughs> kept getting bigger kept getting bigger, right? And we're like, whoa, there's something going on here, right? And, uh, and I actually stopped the recording at that point in time. But if you would have kept going, I mean, literally, it took up the whole screen. It was nuts, OK? So naturally, you had this great Starborn. Um, this turned into a huge phenomenon around K-pop coming into the country, uh, TV syndication deals, everything you can imagine. You know? And recently, we, we crossed 2 billion views right, on YouTube for this one video, right, literally a couple weeks ago. So this kind of amazing thing happens by going global, but you have to keep an eye on it. And I'm just curious, like, how many of you instrument for the things that you work on all the countries using your app? Okay. Probably, and unless it's totally relevant to you, probably more of you should. And I encourage you to do a very simple thing. Look at your top 10 countries, pay attention to them, and when you get some money, go visit them, right? <laughs> you know, but generally, start to think about these things, and it has real impact on the way you build and the way you view what you're doing. And uh, I'll skip this one, but we, well, I'll talk about it. So the basic idea here is one of the things, too, about keeping an eye on countries is we started to see trends earlier on. One of the big things we noticed in Korea, so YouTube's video, okay, and video's heavy on the internet, it's heavy on your phone, when you have cap data plans, it's actually like, why would I always want video here? And desktop's are easy to get, and YouTube links are shared on the web pretty regularly. So, but we noticed in Korea, this was several years ago, that for all YouTube usage, greater than 50% of usage was happening on a phone, which is kind of crazy for us, right? And tablets weren't that big and penetrated at that time either. So seeing that made us think that, whoa, we, we got to really jump on this mobile wave and get a lot more aggressive than we had. And we'd been thinking of it largely as an afterthought. So looking at different markets, they can be leading edge indicators for where you're going. So I encourage you to take advantage of that. OK. Next one, um, how many of you think you own a feature out there? No one? Wow, this is good. Cool. <laughs> good job. Yeah, good crowd. So when I started out, a lot of the way I thought about what I did was owning pages. And I was responsible for the watch page of YouTube or the upload page of YouTube. And I didn't really think of myself as owning like a platform and what that really meant. And that, when we started to reorient the way we think about things as a platform, it changed the way you look at things. And a good example of that is what do we do with, let me jump through this animation, but what do we do with, so we have something called a uh, content ID. And you can think of content ID really simply if you look, if you, rewind way back in time. It's like a rights man management vehicle that helps you help content pro owners take down content. And when you think about that, it's a set of features, right? It's like someone can go out there, find a video, claim it, and say, that's mine, take it down. But now, if you look at these stats, it's pretty, pretty amazing. You know, 250 years of video are scanned every single day. So let's look at it from a different perspective. Think about this as this huge data platform. We've also, we've basically pivoted to think about YouTube as the world's biggest focus group. 
So by thinking about it more as a platform, you start to do marvelous things. So we said, instead of thinking about this as rights management, think about it as a pulse on every single time someone is sharing music and how much, how much how ma what's that magnitude of music out there? Now let's take that as a data set and share it with people out there. And what we did, look at things like Harlem Shake. So, I think everyone remembers Harlem Shake, pretty fun time. But there's no official music video for Harlem Shake, right? There's hundreds of thousands of official music videos for Harlem Shake. So by scanning all this stuff, getting a pulse on it, and taking that data, we can now say Harlem Shake is super powerful and popular. And then we can pass it on to people who care about that. And so what was awesome with this is for the first time in 20 years, you have an artist debut at the top of the Billboard charts, an independent artist, right? And so take the things you have, think about them as a wealth of data, and then turn that data into a product. And when you think about a platform, you're thinking about users that use it, people who publish on it, and then the data that you have through this marketplace, real or you know, um, illusory. And so generally take that information and do something with it. So when you're a product manager, don't think about that feature. Think about what it means as a platform and start to build around it. Cool. Jump ahead. OK. The next thing is, and I think this is something that's not as relevant to a lot of you. I'm sure everything you do, you think of as awesome right now. And you invest your time on it. When I first started getting out in product management, I thought of consumer features, and I thought of business features. And every time it was a business feature, we didn't stick a designer on it, right? You know, like we basically stepped back and said, huh, who wants to work on this? Like you wouldn't necessarily get your best people on it. And not surprisingly, it looked like shit and everyone complained about it. And then you'd have your consumer features, which you'd overweight on. So one of the things we really believe on this is that, you know, even things like ads can be awesome. If you look at everything you do and look at it with pride and take it to the next level. And so some of those things, does everyone remember Dollar Shave Club? Okay, so it's probably, like for me, when I saw this, I was like, I don't understand. Like for the first time I asked myself, why doesn't everyone create an ad, right, like this? And the idea of even thinking why should everyone create an ad was new to me. And so one of the things we've really stepped back on is say, let's have a high quality bar for everything we do, and let's make it all awesome. And so since then, there's been just so many. Um, my, my favorite one of last year was the Van Damme split, which, uh, Pretty amazing. Um, I grew up on Van Damme movies. But everything from like Mike Tyson giving a Evander Holyfield, right, his ear back is probably one of the best <laughs> ads I've ever seen. And now, like when we look at these advertising festivals and what goes on there, they're all YouTube videos and they're all ads. And some of them get watched millions upon millions of times a week. And so that's what you want to aspire to with everything you do back office, front office, you know, administrative tools, support tools, it doesn't matter. Make it great. Cool. I think we've all learned this one <laughs> throughout our careers is like you got to fail multiple times. And for us, I think there's no better, better uh, portrayal of this than what we've done in terms of translation. YouTube's had this basic I idea, which is like democratizing video for everyone. And what that's really meant is publishing once and publishing instantly for anyone in the world in any language. That's what we want to be, and we want to do that without gatekeepers. But to do that, we have to try a bunch of different things. So, you know, our first stab at kind of automatically translating videos through algorithms looks something like this. As you can imagine, that's not what they're actually saying. And so here's a little, the next round, we got a little bit better. But we also realized we can only do this in English. So we'd go out there and a bunch of our, you know, 80% of usage is elsewhere in different languages, and so it didn't work for them. And then recently, literally in last week, we started doing crowdsourcing of translations. And what we do with that is we take the ones that we automatically generate, put them on a timeline, and then let the crowds come in who actually speak the language to translate. And then what we do with our magic is just automatically link it back to audio. So it's a real seamless experience. But to get here is basically a road of three years of try and fail and try and fail and learning from each one. So I do think it's important with a lot of your projects to think of this long horizon 
but have multiple milestones. And to develop a culture in your organizations which says that some of these things are going to take years. And if you look at the great companies, a lot of things they tried, they tried again and again and again. Never be that person who says, we tried it, right? We tried it already. Chances are you just tried it at the wrong time. Okay. Another one we had was, uh, so we've been trying to get on TVs forever on YouTube. And we've always been stuck with that remote control. And the problem with YouTube is that a lot of times you're making a decision every two minutes, not every 20 minutes. So just imagine if you have to use your TV remote control every two minutes to make a choice, and you'll realize why TV never really took off for us. And then finally, we started working on this idea of like just pairing your mobile phone with your TV screen. And that way, you can just find and use your mobile phone and effectively do it. That later became a vision that later became Chromecast, effectively, which is letting anyone do that with their TV. But to get here, we just had to be really patient, try a bunch of things. And if you'd looked at some of the UIs early on, um, there's some former YouTubers in the room who probably were disgusted by them. But generally, I'd say it took a long time to get here. And it just took trying and trying and trying again. So if you feel like you're failing every day, you're probably doing something right. Okay. And then the final thing is that we all care about happy users. Remember to spend time with them. Remember to understand what you're doing with them and what you're doing for them. And if you have a real story about enabling people to do things they couldn't do without you, you've made it. For YouTube, one of the best examples of this is indie music, where a lot of people, and I'll start with one actually. Could you play this video, please? Does anyone know Molly Kate Kessner or heard of her? Everything's wow. gonna be all right. She whispers to so it's a little too depressing of a song, so we're not going to spend too much time on it. But six years old and I as she hid behind that show. You can pause it. Daddy so she sang the song on a broken iPhone with a busted piano and uploaded it onto YouTube. And if we go to, to the next slide. And so it started trending a little bit, and someone picked it up. And some celebrity picked it up and put it on their Facebook page, said, this is really cool. You know, and now, and we look at this timeline of what happened. Right. And so just culminate, this is a period of, I think, less than six months, effectively. But if you look on May 17, 2014, you know, Kessner debuts hits number 42 on uh, the iTunes charts. And for her, this all started out filming herself on YouTube, putting up a little song that she wrote in six weeks. Okay. It's her first kind of real song. Six months later, right, she's like going on tour, she's got... 12 million lifetime views, 175K subscribers. And she'll probably be picked up by a label anytime like this today, probably, right? And so these kinds of things really matter. So spend time with the people that you serve. Understand how you've changed their lives. And if you really are doing something important there, you've, you've done a lot in the world. All right, thank you, everybody. Hope you enjoy. Any questions? All right. Did, wait, uh, did you see Ian's, Ian's talk earlier? Uh, no, no, I didn't actually. Sorry, Ian. Yeah. <laughs> we work very closely together, though. <laughs> <laughs> um, any comments on it? Just yeah. any, any thoughts on, on what you're doing in the UX reaction? He talked about UX and the interface with, with you because you yeah. guys are peers. I'm interested in your, in your, in your view of, of the best way for you to work with UX and how that interfaces with yeah. what you presented today. So one is um, when you think about thinking about a platform, thinking about the impact you have on people, the user experience is not just about like how the buttons are laid out on the page. It's truly about tasks and feedback loops and how people feel when they use the product. So at YouTube, we've become much more design-centered in how we do things. So put another way, Ian's doing more of my job, which is really great, so <laughs> the way it used to be. And he's actually helping to define how users actually have to right, experience a product in order to achieve these broader goals. And so a second question is, uh, we get a lot of uh, requests to um, be very specific about uh, tactical things with regards to product development. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering how you could talk about when things don't work for you from yeah. a product perspective, how the learnings from the, from the uh, failed launches 
how those are incorporated actually back into the product in terms of optimizing what you're doing. If you could be very yeah. tactical with, a, with a, even a single right. example, that would be great. Yeah, I think the key thing there is to be separate about two things. One is, often you have the right strategy to begin with. And sometimes your failings might be that you actually had the wrong strategy. Um, in those cases, you should really step back and say, well, how are we approaching the problem? Like, I think the translation one's a good example on that front. The strategy of saying, hey, I'm going to actually just listen to every video and figure out how to translate that to every single language just through a machine, that's a tough one, right? The idea of seeding it with you know, languages that we can do that for so we make it easier for people to crowdsource those translations, that makes a lot of sense, right? Human and machine together. So we did have to step back on that one and say, you know what, this isn't just a UX issue. This isn't like we don't have enough engineers. This isn't that we haven't put enough people at the problem. The strategy was fundamentally flawed, which is you can seed things, but to really scale them, you're going to need people too. So that required a reset, and that's why it took some time. In some cases, it's just simply, well, we tried to do it, but we did, the strategy was right, the way we did it was right, but the, what we actually designed has failed. Like in that, you can often get through logs, qual feedback, you know, user experience research, period. And you'll just say, oh, it's just too complicated. It didn't work. I didn't actually find my way around the product. In those cases, it's usually about constant iteration and getting back to the basics of making sure people can use it. Back there. Use of real names on commenting and, and sort of how you dealt with that initiative to use Google Plus on yeah. comment. Yeah, sure. I think um, there's two things about that. One is, so does everyone know about the issue basically on YouTube? We ask people to use their Google Plus account, right, and effectively set up a profile. And when they're using YouTube, they're using it under that profile. So one thing is that we set up kind of two models for that. One is that we felt, we felt there's a fundamental principle around you know, anonymity on YouTube. So while people could set up a profile and use their real name, we also let them set up a page so they didn't have to use their real name. But I think one of the things we've learned about this one too is that we have to be careful with our different apps and the communities they represent. And a lot of people did not want to be in a community, right? Basically, by joining YouTube and using their Google Plus identity, they actually became a part of the Google Plus community. And that was not something that they wanted. So what we're really focused on now is being just more intelligent about when we do these things, saying, does your identity matter in one place, right? Do you actually want to use both apps, right, with that same identity, right? And if you do use both apps with different identities, you have the option of saying, don't let me be present in the other one. So we're approaching this with much more diligence on that front so that it will never happen again like that. Hey, I, I don't know if you saw the Kickstarter talk about art way versus product way. Yeah, I saw a okay. little bit of it, yep. So that thing about Molly, what's her face? Yeah. That struck me as being sort of a similar problem that yeah. Kickstarter was, she's an artist, right? Yeah. She wants to build something, yeah. an audience. I, I'm curious, particularly given yeah. Google's reputation, if if there's any been sort of like, let's do this the art way, right? Yeah. Um, you know, just my personal opinion is that YouTube feels very functional sometimes. Yeah. It seems like there could be a way to make it a bit more inspiring for a creative sure. person Yeah. Who, who, you know, like Molly, for example. Yeah, yeah. You should spend some time with Ian on this one, too. Like, I, yeah. I feel strongly about it. So one of the things is we're trying to get more of that creative DNA into how we do things. And the way we've done that is actually, like, one way is opening our own studios, right? Where creators come in every day, and our product engineering and UX teams actually go down there and interact with them directly. There's two aspects of that, right? One is try to experience the product as a creator. And so everyone on my team by now has created a pretty bad video, right, and tried to upload it on YouTube and has had people comment on it and, you know, you know either love them or hate them. You know, there's often a lot of cleverness in those comments. So you put that together, one is just experiencing your own product. You have to be careful about obviously designing a product for yourself though too, or thinking that the art that you want to experience is actually something you can design. So the other side of it is that we're stepping back and saying, well, hmm, what's our lens on this? One lens is says, get YouTube entirely out of the way. YouTube should almost be invisible. The brand of the creator should be front and center. It should be almost like a utility. It should be like the TV screen. In other words, it should be Chrome, and that's about it. And there's another one which says, hey, and these aren't mutually incompatible, but 
as we're actually interfacing with the creator directly, make it a pleasant experience with feedback and not make it so analytical. That's one piece we really want to actually focus a lot more on. A good example of that is that if you use things like YouTube Insights, it's our analytics tool, it's largely about the way we might slice and dice graphs to answer a question. For most creative people, it's incredibly intimidating, right? And actually, for most normal humans, it's actually incredibly in intimidating. So we're looking at that and saying, what's our questions framework? How do we simplify it? And really just give them answers they can act on. So even though it's not truly about art and aesthetics, it does apply in that, in that domain. Yeah. So uh, I just want to say a huge thank you to Shiva for ending the day on kind of such an uplifting note. Cool. It's awesome. Thanks, buddy. Good seeing you. Yeah.